Hello, I'm Janet Neal, the founder and queen bee of the Superb Woman Incorporated. So glad that you've joined us tonight. And if this is your first time, welcome. You are in for a treat. We have, of course, another amazing superb woman that you'll be meeting in just a minute. But let me speak to you a little bit about the superb woman. I come from the belief that women have the power to change this world in an instant when we realize it. So often we have bought into this superwoman role, something that is all about doing. It's all about what someone else says you should do. And we have fallen for it, hook, line, and sinker. I am one that was very guilty of it for many, many years. I like to call myself a reformed superwoman. But better yet, I now call myself a superb woman. And on this show, you will see examples of many, many superb women. So what is a superb woman? A superb woman is a woman who is comfortable in her own skin, a woman who has taken the time to understand what is important to her, what her values are, what her passions are, what her goals are, and has crafted and is living a life that honors all of those. And as a result, is living a very powerful life and is doing a lot of amazing things and putting back positive energy. These women on my show are perfect examples of this. Women who have learned that being is not a sedentary word. Being is an active word. Being means learning to take the time to understand yourself and tapping into that innate power that all of us have. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this next guest of mine on Superb Woman Sundays at 7. And come back next week for another fantastic, superb guest. Hello, and welcome to Superb Woman Sundays at 7. I'm your host, Janet Neal, the founder and queen bee at the Superb Woman. I'm so glad that you're here tonight. And of course, we have another superb woman as my guest. Sue Matthews is my guest tonight, and I am just so excited for you to hear her story. It is a powerful story. It's, I've heard it a few times and oh boy, I hope I don't have to go run out and get the tissues in the middle of this one. Um, but it's just a beautiful story and Sue has really taken on um, the qualities of a superb woman through her journey. Um, and so I wanna welcome Sue to our show tonight. Thank you, Jana, for that beautiful introduction, and thank you for including me in your show. Yeah. So excited to have you here. So let me tell you guys a little bit about Sue. Sue and I met through some mutual friends um, through networking, and um, I always tell people how we met just to encourage you that, you know, I meet all these amazing women because I go out there, and I meet people, and I know people who know people, and um, you can do the same. Um, there's a lot of amazing women and men out there as well um, and that are just very open um, to connecting. So that's why I tell people how we met. Um, I also want to tell you a little bit about Sue's background. Um, Sue comes from um, a CPA background and I'm going to let her tell that story how she got into that um, and has gone from being a CPA to running this amazing charity now. So Sue, why don't you take us through that? How did you tell us the story how you got into becoming a CPA in the first place and then take us through um, your charity which is Conquering Kids Cancer, a Taybans organization. Okay, in the beginning of my life, I don't understand why I'm one of four children, but my father picked me, unknown reason, to take the course to be a CPA and study accounting in college. At 16 years old, I was the one who had to take the bus to a train, to a subway, all the way down to Wall Street, while all my friends were at, on teen tours enjoying their summer. This is how it started. Mm -hmm. I ended up working for Deloitte, and I worked there for seven years, leaving as a senior manager, specializing in mergers and acquisitions. I wouldn't say I'm a typical accountant, but I loved it because I loved interacting with my staff and the partners and the client tremendously. So it was a very fun job, and I still have very, very dear friends of their over 30 years from that job. Excellent. 
Excellent. All right. So you're a CPA and you're working in the city and then you get married and you have a family. Tell us about that. So I get married, have a family and decide I'm going to be a stay at home mom. I have three beautiful daughters mm -hmm. and I was, I, I thought I was too lucky. I truly believed I was too lucky. Life was too easy. We had no financial concerns. I was so blessed mm -hmm. to live every moment with my girls. I had a wonderful husband. I was truly living the white picket fence mm -hmm. life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And because of that, something was always nagging in my back, in the back of my head that something is going to happen. Clearly, I never thought it would happen to my daughter. Mm -hmm. But because of that, I'm actually grateful for that, because of that, I spent every moment in the presence. I took nothing for granted. Mm. I really enjoyed my time. And I, my girls were 8, 11, and 13 when Taylor, being the 11-year-old, was diagnosed with cancer. So I had some really good years in there. That's fabulous. And you know, I like the thing that you just said, because um, when I hear you saying, um, it would sounded like you were waiting for the other shoe to drop. But instead of living in a fear, you were living in the moment to take the most out of every moment, just in the um, in case something happened. So that's a different spin on that that whole uh, feeling behind that. So tell us then about Taylor. And I've heard this story before, but tell us more about her. Um, so Taylor was 11 years old and she was diagnosed with virtually no symptoms, was in school, just had a slight shortness of breath. The pediatrician said it was exercise-induced asthma and criticized me for going to a pulmonologist. One of the reasons I took my kids to doctors quickly, my father has a quirky side of his life, making me a CPA, but my mother never took us to doctors. Oh, wow. So that kind of, as a mother, I kind of went exactly the opposite way. Huh. Yeah, I did because her tumor was close to her spine, and if she wasn't diagnosed within two months, she would have had some kind of paralysis. Wow. But anyway, she took her diagnosis with determination, force. She was going to beat this. She never in a million years thought she was going to die. She thought mommy and daddy were going to take care of everything. Mm -hmm. And her first reaction was the treatment protocol that were given for her particular disease was over 40 years old. Her first reaction was, mommy, I want to help other children with cancer. Mm -hmm. I want to save somebody's life. So she waged a a war against cancer by starting her own foundation, which was named Tay Bands, Tay after Taylor, and Bands being that she had professionally manufactured hair bands, which we thought was odd considering she was bold, but mm -hmm. she thought it was going to be a $5,000 bake sale and it really took off. We raised about a million five at this point. Wow, wow, wow. So, so Taylor has cancer and she's undergoing treatments and, um, and your life turns completely upside down. Your life, to, not to use a cliche, but your life turns upside down in a dime. You're in shock. You don't know what to do. You don't know what hospital to go to. You choose the most premier hospital and maybe that isn't the right decision. You're bombarded with treatment plans, protocols. Suddenly who's taking care of your other children? who's going to be present for them. I mean, it's, it's a whirlwind and it's all done buzzy. I mean, you just can't imagine that this actually happened, that you heard the words, my child has cancer. That being said, that was my reaction. My husband was extremely strong throughout the entire thing. And Taylor was extremely strong. And the first weekend she was in the hospital, she had over 40 visitors. She thought it was a party. She had absolutely no idea what was involved here or the extreme suffering that she would endure. Wow. Wow. She did everything in life by the seat of her pants and just mm -hmm. went with it. So she really lived in the moment as well. You know what? She really lived in the moment and she believed in life. All you need is love. Oh. She, felt, she felt strongly that love is what all life is about. And she was just one funny, tough kid. And, you know, one of the biggest messages I'm, would give to parents with a child with diagnosis, let them have fun, let them celebrate life. They're kids. You can't take this away from them. Unfortunately, we had to do that by breaking the rules. I taught her how to drive when she was 12 years old. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I figured if a cop stopped me, stops me, she'll take off her hat and it was bald. I actually dreamed of being stopped and telling the situation, but we never got stopped. Two weeks before she got her permit at 16, my husband said enough. 
<laughs> if she gets caught now, she'll never get her permit. <laughs> so drove, I had a huge SUV at the time, with, always packed with kids. She drove every place. Wow. And you were telling another story about breaking the rules when she was in the hospital and she wanted to come home for Halloween. Why don't you share that story with us? Yeah, she wanted to come home for Halloween and her birthday, which required losing her IV pain medication, taking out chest tubes. So she suffered brutally. It was four days before she was to come home after a major lung um, thoracotomy. She suffered brutally in that situation to take off her pain meds and to get her chest tubes out. She begged them for that. And then the night before we left, the surgeon said, well, Taylor, you need oxygen. You're on full-time oxygen. You can't get home. And she just, one of the only times that I saw her completely defeated. She turned away from the doctor, cried. He walked away. She was extremely close to her doctor, her surgeon. And I said, you know what, T, we're going to make it work. Somehow or another, we were going to make it work. Mm -hmm. So I, it was probably eight or nine o'clock at night. The social workers had left. I spoke to the nurse, the main nurse on, on the floor that night. And I said, I need oxygen by the morning. I need it to be in my house, portable oxygen tanks. She screamed and yelled at me. This is not my job. I have nothing to do with this. That is incredibly not possible. And I thought, are you kidding me? This is a child with cancer. She wants to be home for Halloween and her birthday. Mm. And to be honest with you, my memory sometimes has fallibilities. I don't exactly know what I did thinking I stayed up all night. All I remember is my babysitter calling me in the morning saying the oxygen's been delivered. Wow. Wow. She, just fought, she fought the system. I mean, her first thoracotomy, which was much more serious, that was a 14-hour surgery. She was staying with my husband in the hospital and decided at midnight in New York City that she wanted to go to Ben and Jerry's. Oh. So there she was in that open hospital gown, which she didn't really ever wear. She typically wore shirts that said, um, good hair day, or think outside the box when we had to tease the doctors. But she was hooked up to so many IVs, she had to wear it. So there they were with her hospital gown floating. At one o'clock in the morning, they snuck off the floor. Finally reached the top of the hill, finally reached First Avenue, and she was too exhausted. Aww. But at that time, security called me. They had my cell phone. And I didn't react at all. I said, if she's with my husband, I think she's totally fine. Then they brought the security guards out to find her. <laughs> As my husband tells the story, they were hopping and puffing much more than she was. Oh, geez. We needed fresh air. We needed to make her be a kid. And she wanted to celebrate life. The night before she passed away, she said to us, Mommy, we were in Germany for alternative treatment. She said, Mommy, am I making it back for my girlfriend's sweet 16? She thought we were going to get our treatment, met it back or back, and she was going for a sweet 16 the following week. Oh, wow. Wow. So she was 16 when she passed. She was, yeah. She had just had her own sweet 16. Oh, my goodness. So here was a girl whose diagnosis, how long had they initially given her? Three months. Three months. And she lived five years? Just shy of five years. Wow. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. And that is also because we fought the system. Mm -hmm. the doctors in one hospital gave up. We looked for another hospital. She was treated in England and she was treated in Germany. She was treated all over the United States. And that was my husband. He just, one thing after another, he worked by day researched by night, gotten a million second opinions, and she was able to live. That's why she always thought daddy's just going to take care of it. Mm. Completely reassured about that. And so how have you kept what she started alive with Tay Bands? Well, I continued in the foundation, and honestly, I'm extremely lucky that she left me her legacy. It was her determination, her wishes, her hopes and dreams to save a child's life. Now that's my job, which I've continued the foundation. It's been eight and a half years since she passed away. And I feel like I'm extremely grateful because what better job in life is than helping to save children's lives? Mm, absolutely. So I'm lucky that keeps her alive for me and gives me a reason to survive. Absolutely. So tell us more about the, the foundation. What is it that it does? Um, we are completely chartered to. Um, fund research. We also tremendously raise awareness. So we go to the, we're 
called on by different doctors and different institutions and we pick the best trial that we think that the research should go to. But one of our mantras, which is will and it will always be, is that we're gonna fund research the child receives today. Today is the only child the day with cancer has. We're not going to fund a trial or research when the child will receive the treatment one or two years down the road. So how do you find these different trials? Well, I'm still very close to doctors at many hospitals. Mm -hmm. So they come to me as well as I get solicitations in the mail, I get emails, things of that, and our board decides who the grants will go to. I also have an honorary member on our board that she's now working for a different company, but she was the number two doctor in charge of sarcomas at the National Institute of Health. So she weighs in on what we should fund as well. Amazing. That's fabulous. So let me go back to um, a point that you made earlier that when um, Taylor was first diagnosed, um, the options that you had were 40 years old. Um, so can you talk, and I know that's what your organization is about, is about bringing um, treatments forward for pediatric cancer patients. So how is that going? Is that changed much? In the world of pediatric cancer and adult cancer has changed dramatically in the last five years, basically because of precision medicine and using immunology. Immunology is to foster your own body to fight the cancer. Because mm -hmm. not only has a gene mutated, most of us have cancer cells in our body, but our immune system is able to fight it. Mm -hmm. So something's also gone wrong with your immune system. system. Precision mm -hmm. medicine, which is what we're funding exclusively, is taking an individual child's germ cell and their tumor. It's no longer one size fits all. Mm -hmm. If you have a leukemia, you used to be um, treated by a standard protocol. They're actually taking that child's individual cells, analyzing them, and figuring out a more targeted treatment. Basically, children with pediatric cancer, at least two-thirds, and that number is going up, have severe chronic side effects if they are survivors, and many of them die within absolutely within the first three years. Mm -hmm. Because treatments for pediatric cancer are so much harsher than adult treatments, mm -hmm. because the kids metabolize so quickly. Mm. So you're not only looking for um, targeted treatments, you're also looking for less toxic treatments. I see. So are these um, um, treatments um, it, available in facilities across the country or is this in a targeted area? Um, the pre precision medicine is widely available now, but they can do it depends what the equipment and the expertise of the doctors have, mm -hmm. how much they can analyze the cell, depends what the patholo pathologists can do as well. Mm -hmm. Columbia Medical University, which is where we're exclusively funding right now, mm -hmm. is very high on that scale. They're much, that and one other hospital in the United States are much more advanced in analyzing cells and coming to a treatment. They also, it doesn't always happen, but they look for when they find the DNA mutation, they look for a drug that can block it as well. I see. Excellent. So tell us how people can get involved with the charity. Donate, donate, donate. <laughs> <laughs> Good idea. <laughs> the more money we have, I'm not hesitant to ask it for it. The more money we have, the more children's lives we can save. Also, we do a tremendous work about raising awareness. So if anyone wants to join us on that journey, you can contact us through the information you'll put up after. Excellent, yes. And to that point, we will have a slide at the end of this we'll we'll, bleh, that will have all the contact information um, for Sue and the charity. Um, I just, I'm in such awe of the wonderful work that you are doing and continue to do. and. And I just find it so interesting that, you know, here you are running a, um, a major organization right now. Um, and how much do you think that, that what your father kind of pushed you into has helped you uh, where you are today? Well, he was determined to get me where he wanted me to be, giving me great determination, courage to pursue his path when I wasn't exactly my path and strength to do it. And it ended up in a very good situation. So, and 
those traits were passed on to all three of my girls, but Taylor in particular, she was never giving up. Absolutely. I felt an obligation to my dad and I set my ways, determined to do exactly what I do and not give up. Yeah, absolutely. So speaking of your dad, who else has helped you on your path? Well, my mentors in life have really been my husband and my three girls. Mm. They have supported me and I have um, a younger sister who lives in Charlotte who is truly my soulmate. They have brought me through this journey in life, which includes living the white picket fence to severe tragedy and loss of a child. Mm -hmm. They have been there for me 100%. They've supported me. I also have very dear friends. And I moved to New York City five years ago and joined several networking groups. Mm -hmm. And the networking groups and the women I've met in the networking groups didn't know Taylor. Mm -hmm. So they've made Taylor come alive for me. They've helped support me, helped with fundraisers, and they've helped Taylor come alive for me again. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it, we speak about her all the time. And that's the way I survive. That's beautiful. That's I'm also working with a writing professor. I'm writing a memoir about our journey through cancer to help other families with their journey through cancer. And the major focus of the book is to help other parents, but it's also, uh, the focus is the celebration of life. Oh, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. Uh, so I also talk about um, superb women in addition to realizing you can't do this by yourself and having a tribe around you that will help you. Um, that I've also noticed that superb women have learned to give up shoulds in your life. What about you? Yeah, there are many shoulds, and I'm releasing them one by one. One should that I felt guilty about tremendously for years was not being present enough for my other girls. Mm. It, it was an extremely difficult situation as I was in the hospital on a way with Taylor the entire time. But even when I was home, I was too focused on Taylor. I mean, I needed to be. Right. I wasn't present in the moment for them. Mm -hmm. We've talked about it. We've discussed it. Now that they're older, they really understand. And they've given me the freedom to release that show. Mm. Oh, that's nice. Very nice. Yeah, I can understand that. That would be a, that would be a difficult one that would produce a lot of guilt. Yeah, I mean, there's books about it, the lost siblings. They get just get lost, and the, they're nervous and scared about their sister, but they lose their parents in one split second. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, that sounds wonderful that you've um, been able to talk about that and kind of everyone do a little bit of healing around that. Right. Yeah, and the thing that about shoulds that I'm always talking about is the shoulds is what contains the guilt. So um, when we learn to release those shoulds, the guilt goes um, along with it. Yeah. So it's, it's good to hear that you did that. Yeah, you talked problem. a little bit about gratitude before, but tell us again how gratitude plays into your life. Well, I can't believe after losing a child at 16 years old and watching her suffer for five years that I have an extreme amount of gratitude in my life. I feel if you don't have gratitude, you don't live a full life. Mm. You're jealous or always wanting more. That is not a good way to live. You need to be happy with where you are, live in the moment, be present. Mm -hmm. I'm extremely grateful for my husband and my three daughters. I'm extremely grateful that Taylor lived for 16 years and that I had her for those five years. Mm -hmm. Someone once asked me, would it have been better if she never lived? And I was honestly shocked at that question. My answer to that is I had her every moment. She was born a joy. She left us as a joy. I just didn't know the terms when she was born. Yeah. But I'm extremely grateful for that. And I'm extremely grateful that she left me her legacy. Uh, it's a way for me to continue. It's a way to save children. It's a way to survive her death. And it's a way for me to be grateful for what I'm actually doing. Mm -hmm. To be honest with you. At my age, after raising children, I didn't know if I was going to go back to accounting. I didn't know what I was going to do. It's always that kind of, oh, my God, I've stayed home with the kids, and what am I going to do in my 50s? Right. And she gave me the gift. She gave me the gift of life. Oh, that's beautiful. No, thank you. And, yeah, and what a legacy to continue. That's a, that's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. And I love what you just said, that you just didn't know the, the terms. Um, and, and isn't that true? None of us knows what the terms are. 
um, and if you can stay in the day and um, embrace what is, um, you know, you don't waste that time. No, I've really had to work very hard to live in the present. I did before she was sick, but I didn't live in the present as much as I wanted to while she was sick. Mm -hmm. But I've worked very hard in mindfulness. There's a particular exercise class called Modicize, which is a mind-body reset class. Oh, wow. where the endorphins that you get while it's a cardio class, the endorphins that you get while you're exercising. And the instructor gives you affirmations, goals, things to release while you are doing the class. And through that class, through doing uh, you know, punches and jail breaks and squats, I truly was able to release all the pain and suffering that I watched my daughter endure. At this point, it doesn't do me any good to focus on that and focus on the negativity. I've had to put all negativity in a box and throw it down the river and only focus on positive things. Mm -hmm. And I have been able to release that. That's fabulous. Tell us again the name of that exercise. Modicize. And the woman who runs it is Sonia Satar, S-A-T-A-R. Here in here. She's another very superb woman. <laughs> and a dear friend. <laughs> Excellent, excellent. So Sue, tell us what's next. What's going on with yourself, with the charity? Well, what's going on with myself is I do feel like it's my time a little bit. Mm -hmm. I'm an empty nester, my kids, my other girls are grown up and I feel it's my time to do what I want, to live in the present moment, as we said before, mm -hmm. and celebrate the life that I have, even with the loss of a child. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, Taylor, every morning when I wake up and think about her, she gives me the strength to keep on going. And I awake thinking about what I do is just so important. Mm. So obviously, we want to increase funding to be able to fund research, you know, increase dollars that we're raising yeah. and continue to help others. And we have concrete evidence that we have saved the lives of children with cancer. And that's our goal to keep on saving their lives much more. Excellent. And then obviously completing my memoir, which I hope will help other parents. Oh, I can see where that will. I think that that's very needed out there. I, I know I have friends who have lost a child and it's, it's just devastating. Um, and unless you've gone through it, I don't think you can really understand. No, I don't think you can. I'm thinking of the name of the memoir to be Paint Your Hair Blue. Blue is Taylor's favorite color, but once uh, another parent called and a little five-year-old girl was diagnosed with cancer and she said, what should I do? So I asked Taylor. Taylor's answer was paint your, uh, dye your hair pink, cut it into all different layers, do whatever you can because you're going to lose it. Oh, that's okay. We actually lost her hair three times. We ended up with chemo hair that was frizzy. We ended up with long hair when she was in remission. We ended up with short hair that was spiked with uh, blonde tips. Wow. She really had fun with it. Oh, that's, so that's a message I really want to pass on to other parents to celebrate life. Mm. Well, Taylor just sounds like just the most spectacular girl. And I'm so grateful that you have shared her life with all of us. Um, because, I, and I've heard other people say this, but I feel like I know her. Um, oh, and that's, that's the best thing you could say to me. I want her to live on. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So Sue, I just want to thank you so very much for being my guest today. Um, and for all of the work that you do um, for children everywhere. Oh, thank you so much, Janet. It was such a pleasure to be here. And I so appreciate you giving me this opportunity. Excellent. So I feel like we bonded over this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. <laughs> um, so make sure that you go and check out um, Conquering Kids Cancer's website and donate. Um, help save another child's life. So until next week when we'll have another superb woman, have a superb week. Okay. Take care. Thank you very much. Bye.